shot, Melvin. Look at that. It's, it's fantastic. Just think, Professor Howard. Untouched by human hands these many centuries. Why, we made the discovery of the year. Well, let's get to work. Once we get inside, there's no telling what we'll discover when we catalog all of this. One pin with a bug on it. One pendant scarab. One broken vase. One pottery shirt. One candy bar. One candy bar. One candy bar? Well, it looks like a candy bar. It smells like a candy bar. Tastes like a candy bar. Not bad. Mmm, good. Not enough sugar, though. Sugar? Professor Howard, the Egyptians didn't have sugar. Well, yes, they did. At least they had a form of it similar to ours. Now, Professor Howard, you're speaking to a charter member of the American Geographic and Exploration Society. There's nothing I don't know. Sugar is a fairly recent development. Well, I don't like to be a spoil sport, old boy, but sugar, as you and I know it, was discovered quite differently from what you would suspect. Hey, what's this? What's what? Well, by some strange coincidence, we're in the tomb of a sugar merchant. Now, 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 Professor. Are you trying to say this isn't a pharaoh's tomb, that uh, this fellow here sold little cubes and bags of sugar? Well, no, but he dealt in sugar. See here, the slaves are planting, watering, and harvesting sugar cane on the banks of the Nile River. Oh, then you're proposing the sugar industry began here in Egypt. Oh, no, it was much earlier than that. You see, primitive man began satisfying his sweet tooth with honey from bees. And, of course, he also had plants that contained sugar, such as wild strawberries, grapes, and watermelons. And then, too, he probably discovered very early that the cane of the tall tropical grass he found growing in some parts of India was amazingly sweet. Ah, then the sugar industry originated in India. Well, no, we assume it was India. We're not really too sure. Actually, it may have been the Garden of Eden. Sugar is mentioned in the Old Testament in several places. Here, the prophet Jeremiah says, To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from a far country? And the prophet Isaiah said, Thou hast bought me no sweet cane with money? Although sugar was well known throughout the Middle East, it was rather late in its invasion of Europe. You see, when the Crusaders marched over the Holy Land, they discovered that sugar seemed to be the perfect source of energy. The Arab doctors, who happened to be the best of the time, thought sugar was a cure, and thus it became a medicine. Oh, then that's where we got that old saying. A spoonful of medicine helps the sugar go down. Anyway, the Crusaders spread the use of sugar, introducing it into Europe and mixing a little business with pleasure, started sugar plantations at Antioch, in Syria, and on the island of Cyprus. Sugar was most expensive. It remained a luxury for many centuries. For instance, in the 14th century in England, coarse sugar crystals were traded at the rate of two pounds of sugar for one fat pig. Sugar was so expensive and difficult to obtain that it was only natural that sources other than sugar cane and honey be found. Aha, you mean sugar beets. Yes, sugar beets. But sugar beets are a fairly recent development. Even I know that. Wrong again, Melvin. Some scholars believe that a type of early sugar beet was eaten by the laborers who constructed the great pyramid of Cheops the Egyptian pharaoh who lived almost 3,000 years before Christ. 
Evidently, the beet must have grown wild in parts of Asia, as well as in Egypt. For even in Greece, Hippocrates, the early Greek physician, said that the broth made from sugar beets could cure certain ailments. Why, it was even proposed in olden times that beet juice could be used as a hair tonic for cleaning the teeth and for restoring the flavor of wine that had gone sour. Of course, it could have restored the wine's flavor, but as far as being a hair tonic, by 1500, the sugar beet was coming into its own. The Portuguese poet Gil Vincente recognized this when he wrote, one's head should have as much of brains as the sweetness which the beet contains. Then, early in the 1600s, we find a statement written by a Frenchman, Oliver de Serres, who wrote, the beetroot, when boiled, yields a juice similar to the syrup of sugar. Aha, and that was the beginning of the sugar beet industry. I'm sorry, Melvin, but you're wrong again. It turned out that the juice was much like the fruit of a lemon tree. Very pretty, but impossible to eat. So the scientists of the time began trying to remove sugar from everything else. Strawberries, dewberries, raspberries, watermelons, apples, pears, corn, figs, grapes, quinces, mulberries, plums, pumpkins, even from walnuts and chestnuts. Then in 1747, Andras Margroth, a German scientist proved that the sugar in sugar beets and the sugar in sugar cane was the same, but no one seemed excited. In fact, it was 40 years later before one of his pupils, Franz Eckard, demonstrated that his teacher had been right and that sugar from beets was technically feasible. Under the personal hand of Napoleon, sugar beet fields and factories blossomed out all over France. But again, the industry ran into dire trouble. Ran into trouble? Why, what's so difficult about squeezing a little sugar out of a beet? Well, it seems that when sugar beets are processed... Hey, wait a minute. I thought this looked like an early Egyptian geographic transposer. Look at this. Isn't this magnificent? This will clear up everything, Melvin. The secret of the ages. With this machine, Melvin, we can answer your question as to why it's so hard to get sugar out of beet. Uh, sit down, Melvin. Just relax, Melvin. It won't hurt you. How did you do that? Transmigration of molecules. It has to do with ions and gamma rays, something any schoolboy would know. Now, in regards to the difficulty of extracting sugar from beets, this is a beet field in the western United States. Western United States? Yes, sugar beets are raised in Oregon, Idaho, Utah, in many areas of the temperate United States. These particular beets are being raised by a farmer for delivery to a company with whom he is contracted to raise them. The company then extracts the sugar from the beets and sells it on the market. Extract the sugar? I thought you manufactured sugar. It's the sugar beet itself that produces the sugar. 
It does this in the leaves through a process called photosynthesis. This is nature's way of using the water in the soil, the carbon dioxide in the air, and the energy from the sunshine to grow sugar. The sugar molecules form in the leaves and pass down into the root, where it is stored until it's removed by the sugar factory. Sugar beets are planted in the early spring, and they develop from these peculiar little seeds. This seed used to be a problem because it produced more than one plant. It was what we called a multi-germ. It caused more than one seedling to develop from each seed. And that meant that the little seedlings all had to be hand-thinned so that it left only one plant where there had been several. You see, each beet requires about two square feet of ground all to itself in order to grow properly. Now this new single germ seed has been developed and that with new labor-saving devices that thin out the little beets and save all that back-breaking labor have completely changed the picture. So early in the spring, the soil is prepared and the little seeds are precision planted into long rows. After the seedlings come up and develop four leaves, they are machine thin. These metal tines remove part of the seedlings, leaving just enough of them to ensure a good yield. Then with lots of sun, warm summer days, and a drink now and then, they progress up until harvest time. Beets reach their prime in the late fall and after a last check by company field men are harvested. Now machines remove the tops which are either used as livestock feed or plowed back to help nourish next year's crop and then lift the roots from the ground. Good. The beets are placed in trucks which take them to a sugar beet receiving station. After weighing each truck, the beets are unloaded into a hopper which conveys them into huge storage piles. Later in the fall and on into the winter, the beets are removed from the storage piles and loaded into railroad cars for their last trip to one of the regional sugar beet factories. Then when their time comes, these railway cars are emptied and the beets go into water-filled flumes that move the beets into the factory. These flumes also help wash the beets, but the final cleaning is accomplished in this giant washer. The washed and cleaned beets then take an elevator ride up to the beet slicers. These machines slice the beets into something that looks rather like a shoestring potato, named by the French a corsette. These little cossettes then tumble into a hot water bath where the sugar is soaked out of them in a process called diffusion. Diffusion? Four main stages are used in extracting sugar from beets. These are diffusion, filtration, evaporation, and crystallization. this diffuser, the first change takes place. The cossets are fed into the diffuser through the bottom after they have been scalded. Then the little cossets are soaked in hot water and this causes the sugar molecules to escape through the cell walls of the cossets into the hot water where the sugar is carried in solution. Unfortunately, this hot water soaking also releases other substances from the cosset, such as proteins, potassium, sodium salts, and other non-sugars. Before we can have pure sugar, these must be removed in the refining process.
Yeah, but what happens to the little closets then? Uh, a most valuable byproduct. This closet residue is called sugar beet pulp, and it's removed to the pulp dryer. Good heavens! It looks like a huge laundromat. Yes, it does in a way. Here the beet pulp becomes this interesting product that mixed with molasses is irresistible to cows. Mm, that does look yummy. Wow. Meanwhile, back at the plant, the sugar-laden raw juice is finding its way through this maze of pipes and pumps into the carbonators. Carbonators? What are carbonators? We have to treat the raw sugar by adding milk of lime and carbon dioxide gas. This causes coagulation of the non-sugars, which are then removed in a series of filters. Where do we get this milk of lime? It comes from a lime kiln here in the plant, where lime rock is burned. The burning also produces carbon dioxide gas at the same time, which is used in the carbonation stage. This lime, when mixed with water, becomes milk of lime. And this, when added to the raw juice, absorbs or coagulates part of the non-sugars by attracting them to itself, leaving the little sugar molecules alone. Some of the sugar molecules are still trapped by the non-sugars, so this mixture is then forced through a battery of filters. The lime is filtered out, and with it, poof, go all the non-sugars. Just like that? Poof? Well, not exactly. It's done more than once, to be certain. Ah, then, poof, 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 and we have sugar. No, all we have now is thin juice. In order to get the sugar crystals to form, we have to thicken it up. We do this in a series of evaporators. In the production of sugar from beets, vast amounts of steam are used. The steam is used in the evaporators to concentrate thin juice into thick juice. Needless to say, each time the steam is used, it loses some of its heat. To compensate for this loss of heat, the operating pressure in the next evaporator is decreased. This makes it possible for the thin juice to boil at a lower temperature. The liquid coming from the evaporators is now called thick juice. You know, that is clever. Thin juice thickens and becomes thick juice, but what have you accomplished? We still don't have sugar. Well, what has been accomplished is a concentration of sugar by boiling off much of the water. This raises the sugar content from 10 to 15 percent to as much as 65 percent. Aha, and that dries up and becomes sugar crystal. Well, you're close, Melvin. But crystallization, the fourth stage, is actually done by boiling in gigantic tanks called vacuum pans. The boiling of the juice continues until a point of supersaturation is reached. Supersaturation? Supersaturation is the point where the water carries more sugar in suspension than it would normally carry, and where the liquid actually begins to turn into tiny sugar crystal solids. A technician controls the growth of the sugar crystals. He takes samplings from time to time until the sugar crystals reach just the right size. Then the process is stopped and this thick brown mixture of syrup and sugar is moved into high-speed centrifugal machines where, in revolving metal baskets, the syrup is spun off of the sugar crystals. The sugar is now pure, refined, white satin sugar. That's fine. Now that you have the sugar, what are you going to do with it? The sugar is now shipped out to the ultimate user.
five million pounds of sugar can be stored in bulk waiting for orders to be filled next year. By the way, Professor, which is better, cane sugar or beet sugar? Actually, Melvin, sugar is sugar. But although the chemical composition is identical, the great chefs of Paris always preferred beet sugar to cane. My, Professor, there must be nothing you don't know about sugar. That's true, Melvin. Why did you know that if you add a little sugar to cooking vegetables, that it enhances the flavor?